It's been a while. Lots of new players are checking out the game, and a lot of them ask, how do I defend better? How can I possibly win against an organized assault from Argus? Defense comes down to two major facets. You've got a teammate who is willing to make the calls, and you've got four other players who are willing to cooperate. Without cooperation, your defense will be in shambles. A developer said it best, Defender strategy is a novel. Attacking is a pamphlet. The attackers are straightforward. Their weapons are flexible, their health pools are large. They plan an approach, flashbang rooms, defuse a bomb. They depend on snowballing off of their large health pool and being versatile. The attacker health pool is an astronomical advantage, so at first winning on defense may seem an insurmountable task. For a lot of new players, learning what is effectively two separate games at the same time can be challenging. But once you consider the fact that the two sides play so differently and rely on totally different types of strategy, it immediately becomes much easier to learn both of them. The basics? Defenders move faster and have less health. They have more shotguns than attackers, and they've got access to barbed wire and molotovs. Their tools and stats emphasize both ambushes and utilizing choke points. Let's get through this quickly, and let's begin by running through a typical defense round in chronological order. Each of the chapters of a defense round will be highlighted on the side of the screen as we go through them, beginning with the planning phase. When you first see which tile sets you'll be playing in the match, you'll be able to take note of which maps have a breaker in them. This will be important for anticipating attacks involving night vision goggles. Only select tile sets take place at nighttime. It will also assist a bit in guessing when the wall charge will be used. Not much to say here, individual map layouts have a bigger impact than the tile set itself. Many of you make the first mistake in defending the moment the map comes up. That mistake is closing the map. Do not close the map immediately just to take guns you enjoy using on that tile set. Take gear based on the position that needs to be held. This can't be stressed enough. You are doing yourself a disservice by grabbing your favorite weapon when a Tub 12 or a Legros would have served you better. Defender weapons are not flexible on their own. Each of them specializes in killing attackers in a specific way. The Gruber is, at the time of writing, fabulous at doing tons of damage per second by getting repeated headshots. The Legros is stellar at putting high damage shots down range and penetrating even the thickest walls to thoroughly disrupt and stall pushes. The Ingmar and the KR-82 are powerhouses and deal huge amounts of damage compared to attacker weapons, but fall completely short when up against a shotgun at close range. The Super Shoddy is yeah. much, much more than a smaller Tub-12. In reality, this 12-gauge pocket cannon can be the key to a successful defense. In many cases, if you have a slower long-range weapon, like the F1 Legros, your role is generally to do lots of damage, or even win distant 1v1s. However, the weapon falls short against quickly moving AP-25 wielding attackers. It's there that a weapon that can do a large amount of damage at close range, and quickly, is ideal. The super shotgun enables precisely that. By taking a super shotgun in addition to a ranged weapon, the player can opt for a much more flexible role. Attacker weapons, like we said, are very flexible. They aren't necessarily better than defender weapons by any means, and we'll get to stealing them later in the video. There are two core defender roles, anti-flash and anchor. In a game with such powerful and decisive flashbangs, it comes as no surprise that the core FPS principle of anti-flash, or efficient crossfires, would be important. Let's explain these roles. The anchor is usually an individual who is dedicated to holding the bomb site. If the rest of the team dies or needs to fall back, the anchor can provide support. They are frequently equipped with a molotov to buy time for rotations or to heavily disrupt an enemy push. It is often very practical for the in-game leader or shot caller to be the anchor, as they can sit on the site in cover and watch the tactical map, relaying information until they are needed in a firefight. Let's start to plan out an example map and put an anchor in a safe spot in the bomb room. Let's give him a Molotov. The four other players will generally split up into two pairs. Each pair should play in the aforementioned crossfire called anti-flash. The principle is simple. If one flashbang can completely disrupt both ends of a crossfire, it is not anti-flash. Ensure that if a flashbang were to connect with one of the two players, the other can attack the enemy to stop them from killing their teammate. After putting this video together, I realized I could spend another 20 minutes talking about anti-flash and it would all be worth saying. While neither of us have the time to go through with that, let me at least present you with a careful disclaimer. Not every defense fits into a nice, neat 2-1-2 split. In fact, most don't. Sometimes you have a Legros off-site for wall bangs, and other times someone is ratting in the darkest corner of Killhouse looking for flex tapes. 
Not every room is big enough for defenders to avoid getting spammed by flashes. Sometimes attackers can just throw a flash at your feet on entry, no matter where you're hiding. Eventually flashes will work differently, but right now they're pretty scary. The only counterplay is to be far away and to turn around. It's advisable, so long as flashes perform the way they do now, to not be in the same room as your battle buddy. If you're on factory floor, make sure you spread out lots. You won't have cover, but you can split up. The main idea is once a player is flashed, the other one supports them. Practically speaking, the pairs of battle buddies should cooperate to get kills. The quintessential strategy is to have a barbed wire in a doorway, somebody nearby with a close range weapon, the second player further back with a hard hitting long range weapon. Let's find two powerful crossfires for our players to create. Let's draw in barbed wire locations for our team, and anyone can propose these. A quick reminder, you cannot place barbed wire in front of red doors. If the center section of a barbed wire overlaps with a one by three rectangle that extends from the square that the fire exit is on, the barbed wire will be destroyed in the explosion rendering it useless. Next, let's check if we need to spread utility out. Let's give a second Molotov to the player who is positioned closest to the anticipated entry point and can safely throw it. If the map has power, let's take half of the flares just in case the enemy shuts the light off. Naturally, the players near the breaker will not need a flare, so let's put one on the anchor and another one on someone who is playing further from the breaker. If the breaker room is taken, whoever was guarding it should fall back and get help from the anchor. The flares are best used in wide open spaces. Never throw flares at the attackers. They can pick up flares and throw them away if you give them the chance. Now that planning time is over, setup phase begins. In regards to barbed wire, during setup time, let's place our barbed wire down in the choke points that we drew on the map. A quick tip and reminder about barbed wire placement. Barbed wire is destroyed by grenades, only if the grenade explodes near enough to the center coil of the barbed wire. Anywhere else and it will not be destroyed. In order to place perfect barbs, draw a 1x2 box and cross the box. Standing where the two lines meet is effectively the center. You can position the coils easily with this trick. In doorways, simply walk up to the door, turn, and place it. Ensure you are on the inside of the doorway and not on the side where the attackers could easily frag it. Barbed wire gets destroyed by door and wall charges as well, so if you anticipate one, don't place a barb there. If the map has interactive elements that we need to prepare, such as freezer shelves or dock shutters, let's open up these as well. You can even deploy barbed wire inside or around freezers and make traps out of them. Setup time is over and the round begins. It's important to remember that players can see most activity from the tactical map. Explosions, items dropped on the floor, tracers, etc. The anchor is safely nestled away and can open the map watching for explosive entries or smoke grenades. They'll be able to relay information to their team in case an early rotation needs to happen. The initial breach occurs, a green door will be kicked or shotgunned open, or an explosion will ring out. Make the call by naming the room that they're coming from or the specific entry point, such as shutters breach, fan, Green kicked. Shed. Audio plays a big part in quickly isolating which entry point is being contested. If a kick is heard before a door is breached, you know it has to be an exterior door. For this reason, if you need to kick doors as a defender, try to do that before execution, so you don't confuse your teammates. The anti-flash duos will now encounter a push from Argus. One of the first things Argus will need to do is flash out their entry. It's at this point that defenders should attempt to use a Molotov. A good Molotov can do incredible amounts of damage to the attackers if timed correctly. It should be noted that while Molotovs are exceedingly good at doing lots of damage in an area, they're also meant to delay the attackers for three reasons. Firstly, the attackers are on the clock, so making them lose time is good, but not at all that effective or important when they can theoretically and often in practice breach and clear a room in mere seconds. Secondly, and vastly more importantly, flashbangs are a crucial resource that can be baited out. When attackers are about to push and throw their flashes, defenders can deny their entry with a well-placed Molotov. The timing is precise, however, as you'll need to ensure that you don't get concussed by a flashbang, because that can throw off your aim significantly. Thirdly, and arguably most importantly, you'll need to buy a short bit of time for your allies to reposition if necessary. Often you won't have a perfect 2-1-2 split on the map and the anchor or lurker may be able to help you out at the breach if you buy them time. Whether it's because defenders die or because they need to concede a room due to excessive flashbangs, it's inevitable that defenders will lose some ground. When this happens, you should not all flee into the bomb room and cower. Often this means that flashes and frags will get more value, as more and more defenders end up stacking in the same spot. Avoid stacking together at all costs. To effectively rotate and to really drain attackers of resources, you should have a basic memory of the room layouts and position aggressively at first. Firing shots or throwing molotovs into a doorway and then 
fleeing tends to force out a flashbang or two. The room you fall back into should still be played with your anti-flash duo. Don't forget about this core principle. Make crossfires with whoever you can, and if possible, communicate to your battle buddy that you are falling back so they don't get baited by you. Falling all the way back into the bomb site usually means the anchor's there to help you too. Don't make them come to you. Flanking or lurking is totally an option in due process, but be warned that by isolating yourself, you're often leaving another player alone too. Being heroic and charging into the enemy to make a trade is almost never a good idea. The attackers will still have a health advantage if it's a one for one trade, and now you've left your battle buddy to die a very sad death. In terms of key items, it's pretty simple. Defenders don't have much utility to retrieve, so just ensure that you get the mop or the auto shotgun back if they were dropped. Round order is important, so try not to forget which round comes next. If you just had a messy victory on round 2, and round 3 is factory, you may want to drop a KR for an Ingmar. To clarify, mid-range weapons might be good, but you should give it up for a solid long-range weapon when the next map is guaranteed to benefit from that. Obviously, look for Molotovs and Flares if they weren't used. Stealing. On defense, flashbangs are useless, so ignore them. A Saber with any more than a single magazine is well worth grabbing. It's a one-shot headshot against attackers, and semi-automatic. The clacker is a great pickup if you know that the attackers still have a clacker themselves. If you know the attackers do not have a clacker left, under no circumstances should defenders bring a clacker. You can use the clacker to kill attackers hanging out around red doors right when they place the charge. On rare occasions, you may actually find explosives too. For funsies, you can place them on green doors and make landmines out of them. As for regular weapons, nice. attacker guns aren't too special. Their shotgun is pretty great, but more importantly their guns have powerful flashlights. Their pistol is actually not as good as the GAT-9 in some ways, but it's got a great optic and the aforementioned flashlight, so it's a good pickup. One of the strongest pickups you can get is the frag grenade. Frags can obliterate attackers as they tend to get stacked up. Try tossing these out of red doors just as they're breached, or throwing them into rooms with no full cover, such as arcade or bathroom, where the stalls and pinball machines tend to not block any damage. A word of advice for attackers, do not drop these. Never, ever die with a frag grenade, please. If you're curious about weapon damage values, penetration, and other nuances, check out the spreadsheet linked in the description below. It's updated by fellow due process turbofan Simber and Red Commissar, as well as myself. In the next video, we will analyze a good defense from a due process league match. Check out the DPL over on Twitch, Discord, and Twitter with the links below.